Good, good. Well, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about space weather and in particular interplanetary space weather or the interplanetary space environment. <clears throat> so the outline of the talk is that um, first I'm going to distinguish between space climate and space weather, like much like we do here on Earth, where we distinguish climate from weather. Uh, we'll do that in the space contents, uh, context. And then we'll review some of the solar sources of space weather, um, mainly the photons, plasma, and charged particles that are output by the sun to create most of what we know as space weather. And then finally, we'll take a look at the interplanetary space environment in detail, um, some of the profiles of what goes on in space when there's activity on the sun. And this will be a planet agnostic viewpoint. In other words, we'll just talk about what happens in space. We won't talk about interactions with planets or people. That'll start coming in uh, next week. And there we'll show what the solar wind, CMEs, and radiation storms do to interplanetary space. So, and you've seen some of this from last week's lecture on CMEs. So a little bit of it's going to be rep, uh, repetitive, but sometimes repetition is good for learning, right? So. So diving right in, what is space climate? What do we mean when we say space climate? Specifically, that means that we're talking about things that are changing on a solar cycle or a longer period of time, so 10 to 12 years or longer. <clears throat> there are several things that uh, follow that cycle. For instance, galactic cosmic rays. Um, on the you, we've, we've heard before about the heliosphere and how it's formed by the magnetic bubble around the sun as it moves through the interstellar medium. And that's shown on the left from Ofer Cohen's model. Um, and that has the effect of scattering galactic cosmic rays as they come into the earth. And so the stronger the magnetic field on the sun, the more sunspots there are on the sun, the more cosmic rays are scattered away from the solar system. So on the right, you can see the plot there of the sunspot cycle on the top <clears throat> numbered conveniently. And we are now in, coming into solar cycle 25, actually. And then on the, the bottom of the plot is the cosmic ray flux. And you can see it's varying in antiphase when there are more solar, uh, when there are more sunspots on the sun, the, the magnetic field is stronger, galactic ray flux goes down. Um, also pointed out here is that in the extremely uh, quiet minimum between cycle 23 and 24, the galactic cosmic ray flux actually got higher than it's ever been recorded because the magnetic field of the sun was contracting, shrinking drastically during that deep minimum, and galactic cosmic ray flux went up in proportion. Okay, and it's about a 20% decrease over the solar cycle from sunspot peak to sunspot minimum, typically. <clears throat> Another space climate effect that's been well known for a long time is geomagnetic storm occurrence. So this is a plot on the top. The red line is sunspot number again. And on the bottom, the blue bar chart is geomagnetic storm numbers for years. This is going back to 1865. And this pattern was noticed by Edward Sabine as long ago as 1852. And he mentioned it at the time and said perhaps the sun was influencing the magnetic field of the Earth somehow and was basically laughed out of the room. Uh, because physicists back then had no idea how the sun could possibly influence the magnetic field of the Earth. They didn't know that the sun was actually magnetic. Um, another space climate um, vari variability that's uh, commonly known now <clears throat> excuse me, is the extreme ultraviolet irradiance from the sun. And that varies in phase with the solar cycle. So this is a picture showing the extreme ultraviolet radiation in the 284 angstrom band pass from the SOHO satellite telescope, EIT, over the course of solar cycle 23, basically. And you can see that as active regions rotate onto the sun, which are, of course, sunspots, um, you get a lot of EUV brightening, the heating of the corona above sunspots that we've been learning about all semester, increasing the overall flux of EUV irradiance. On the right, I show that EUV irradiance of the sun is not easily measured. You have to go to space. And so there's been a couple of ways that people have done it starting uh, quite, a, quite a long time ago, really. Uh, and that's to monitor both the magnesium-2 spectral line, which is about 2,800 angstrom, so deep in the ultraviolet, but still observable from balloons, for instance. And then the F10.7 radio emission. And the plot there shows the EUV flux from the SEM instrument on SOHO uh, varying over the course of uh, years, 
and the, the, the residuals of the fits of magnesium two variation in F10.7, which are multiplied here by 10 billion. So obviously these residuals are very small, meaning that the magnesium two and F10.7 are very good proxies for the extreme ultraviolet radiation uh, from the sun. So you can do things like plot the F10.7, well, that should say 10.7, not 107 centimeter, solar radio flux from a ground-based proxy, for instance, and note that it tracks the sunspot number uh, perfectly. So that's another obvious solar climate variation. The sun's extreme ultraviolet radiation goes up and down in sync with the sunspot number. Finally, uh, total solar irradiance. In other words, the totally integrated output of photons from the sun over wavelength also varies in sync uh, with the solar cycle, although at a very low level, it's about a 0.1% variation from sunspot maximum to sunspot minimum. And what I'm showing here on the left is a whole bunch of different uh, satellite measure, measurements of uh, TSI. And then on the right, you can see long-term measurement from about 1600 based on a, a regression onto the sunspots, showing that the irradiance is probably increasing as the sunspot number has been increasing over the last couple hundred years. That's not verified though, this is a model. It's important to keep in mind. The thing to mention here is that the sun is actually brighter when there are more sunspots um, because of the plage surrounding the sunspots themselves. So sunspots make it darker in general, uh, the photosphere, but there is um, compensating brightness around them. another climate feature. And finally, um, the, to get back to the geomagnetic storm intensity, there's evidence that we're going, undergoing longer term variation than just 10 to 12 years, because if we look at a timeline here of extreme magnetic geomagnetic storms over the last 500 years. And these are defined by the aurora being visible down to lower than 30 degrees magnetic latitude. So the bigger the geomagnetic storm, the bigger the aurora, the lower down it gets in latitude. And the really big ones you can see from like Cuba or Hawaii. And these are plots of those ones that are some of them visible from those very low latitudes. And you can see that in 1770, and during the 1800s, there were many more very, very large storms than we're experiencing in the modern era. And so there's evidence that the sun was um, significantly more active in the 18th and 19th centuries than it is now. Okay, so let's move on to space weather as opposed to space climate or in contrast to space climate. What do we mean when we say space weather? Well, there's lots of different definitions depending on whether you're talking about the science of space weather, the forecasting of space weather, the impacts of space weather. Uh, but the first one here is sort of the most general, the variable physical conditions in interplanetary space over time spans of now minutes to days, not years, due primarily to the variable level of magnetic activity on the sun. And this emphasizes that space weather exists around magnetic stars, regardless of whether they have inhabited planets or not. Um, it's, a, it's a characteristic of stellar environments. And then some people talk about space weather as kind of a list of phenomena. They say space weather is the aurora, it's the, it's the geomagnetically induced current. And we'll get into the details of these in the next few lectures. Um, but this is just by way of saying you can discuss space weather as being a collection of phenomena that you might generally consider something like called something like stellar planetary system science. Um, so it's more phenomenological. And then finally, there's the impact of uh, variable space environment on humans and human-made technology. And this kind of goes to the point of when you talk about weather and weather prediction, if it doesn't do anything, it's not really important. So it's not defined as being part of the weather. So that's something like small barometric changes in the Earth's atmosphere. In the Earth's atmosphere don't really count as weather, even though they are phenomenon related to weather. We don't notice it as humans, so nobody forecasts it. Nobody alerts us to it unless it drops dramatically during a hurricane. And that finally uh, brings me to the, the definition that we use when we talk about trying to predict space weather and, and uh, warn and alert people. It's a predictive science that is not necessarily dependent on understanding what's going on in these phenomena listed above. For instance, an example in terrestrial weather is the, the hurricane storm surge here on, on Earth. Uh, it's not really an understood phenomenon. It's not fully understood how storm surges vary in, in, in magnitude given a given hurricane strength, and the forecasters don't care. They don't care if you don't understand it, they can 
still forecast it using empirical models and tools, and they do so because it's important and people need to know about storm surge uh, from hurricanes. So predictive science doesn't necessarily depend on understanding everything deeply, as we often talk about doing for a scientific understanding. So space weather can encompass all of these and any one of these can be used at any given time to talk about various aspects of space weather. Now let's move on to the solar sources of space weather. Uh, as you saw before, the extreme ultraviolet irradiance varies over solar cycle periods as active regions come and go, but it also varies on the solar weather, space weather minutes to days timeframes. And we'll get into that a little bit. And again, next week, we'll see what that, those variations do to planetary environments. Right now, we're just gonna stick to looking at the sun and the interplanetary uh, effects. And then we'll look at solar wind structures. This is gonna be a brief review because we've done this a lot this semester. And then we'll look again at solar magnetic eruptions uh, which put out all three, photons, plasma, and charged particles. And uh, that's, again, going to be a little bit of a quick review because we spent uh, last week focusing primarily on CMEs and solar magnetic eruptions. Okay, so jumping right in on the right-hand side, or the left-hand side there, you can see a movie of the total solar irradiance again, varying as sunspots cross the disk. And here comes a really big sunspot, in fact, the biggest in cycle 24 in October of 2014. And you can see that 0.23% 0 .2 decrease in the total solar irradiance as the sunspot crosses the disk. So pretty puny um, <clears throat> in total solar irradiance. Now look to the right and you see a plot of the extreme ultraviolet output of the sun. Again, this is a proxy. This is the F 10.7 centimeter radio output. Um, but you can see for that same period, it's varying by a factor of three, 300% 300 variation as that sunspot crosses the disk. Because again, the, the heating of the corona above the sunspot is causing very large scale changes in the extreme ultraviolet irradiance from the sun. So EUV um, varies not only on the scale of solar cycle, but on days to particularly solar rotation uh, time periods as things rotate on and off the disk. So anytime you see something like a 27 day uh, periodicity in an irradiance, you can be pretty sure it's due to active regions following the rotation of the sun. A review of solar wind um, structure in the interplanetary space. As we know, the global solar magnetic field determines the interplanetary solar wind structure. So on the left, I'm showing a diagram of a <clears throat> what's called a potential field source surface model. Uh, we've seen these before in the semester. This is one done by Gordon Petrie at NSO to illustrate various aspects of uh, the global solar magnetic field, including open field lines in the polar regions, and, and in this case, reaching all the way down to the equatorial region in the green, uh, open field on the solar pole, on so, the south solar pole in the red, and then streamer closed fields um, shown in blue. On the right is a plot of that same model kind of unwrapped into a, a cylindrical map projection. And that shows that you can define the solar magnetic equator and the heliospheric current sheet by this model. Uh, it varies, of course, as active regions come and go and the large scale structure of the solar magnetic field changes. But it also points out the equatorial coronal hole shown in the green um, shaded areas there as well. And as we know, equatorial coronal holes, coronal holes in general, are where we find this fast solar wind. So um, just to remind you, on the left, again, is, is a plot of solar wind speed um, from, from our own Steve Cranmer and Amy Weinbarger, showing the variation over several different models here, um, but going anywhere from 350 up to 800 kilometers per second. And then on the right is the discovery, actually, image of coronal holes. This was the, taken by the Skylab X-ray telescope in uh, 1972 and three. They discovered these very large scale darkenings. They named them coronal holes. And again, we see the 27 day recurrence here. As the sun rotates around, the structure kept coming back, giving high speed streams of solar wind into the interplanetary space. And it did so in this case over more than four months. You can see it starting in June up in the upper left and going through October uh, in the lower right there. 
So again, a 27 day recurrence of high speed wind due to the global solar magnetic field rotating with the sun itself. And what does that look like in interplanetary space? This is another example from a paper by Nat Gopal Swamy in which a trans-equatorial coronal hole, as they're called, these long coronal holes that reach across the ecliptic and the equator of the sun, roughly equivalent, although the ecliptic is seven degrees inclined. I'm not showing that here, but um, you can see the plot there in the middle is the solar wind speed increasing as the coronal hole cuts across the ecliptic. But note that also the coronal hole doesn't have to be on the ecliptic to affect the solar wind speed measured in the ecliptic near the Earth, in this case at L1 by the uh, ACE satellite. You can see that secondary big peak there is due to that coronal hole I point out with the red arrow on the left, well below the ecliptic, but still a coronal hole close enough to the ecliptic to cause a significant high-speed stream. Uh, in the ecliptic. So it's not just the coronal holes that reach the ecliptic or sit on the ecliptic. Uh, anything stretching towards the ecliptic will generally uh, cause high speed streams of solar wind in the interplanetary space. And on the, on the right here is the diagram. We've seen this one before, I believe, of uh, what we call co-rotating interaction, interaction regions, sometimes called stream interaction regions which again define these collision regions between the fast streams of solar wind coming out of coronal holes and the slower wind ahead of them, creating both a forward shock and a reverse shock uh, structure. And we'll see plots of that later um, in the talk. So this is just all review and reminder that these are sort of structures in the interplanetary space on space weather timescales due to solar magnetic field and solar wind variations. So let's move now to the solar magnetic eruption topic. Again, this was shown last week. It's one of the largest eruptions in solar cycle 24, back on uh, 10 September 2017. This, in this case, it's been rotated north. Uh, solar west is now solar north, so we can get a nicer look at this eruption. And it has all the good features we talked about last week. It has a very large flux rope eruption that you see at the beginning of the movie, right about there. It has a very large flare in both EUV and X-ray. It has post-flare loops, uh, the, the loop arcade forming now. It has the uh, coronal EUV wave and some dimming. So all of these things that we talked about last week are characteristics of solar magnetic eruptions. And just as quick review, the basic idea here is, is a unifying one because it, it deals with any kind of eruption you can you can see on the sun, either from an active region, as we just saw, or from a filament eruption, for instance. And the basic elements of the concept are, again, that you have to form what's called a magnetic flux rope, a twisted magnetic structure in the solar chromosphere or corona. You have to form these over polarity inversion lines, where the different flux of very high strength is coming together, typically in an active region, but sometimes in sheared zones outside of active regions, in the polar regions, for instance. Um, and again, this, this field gets twisted into non-potential configurations, and non-potential configurations can store free energy. So the more twist you add to that structure, the more free energy you can store in that structure. And finally, as that free energy builds up over time by adding more shearing flows, more twist and rise, which combined are known as helicity of the magnetic field structure, that finally causes a plasma instability triggering an eruption, magnetic reconnection allows the eruption to escape, and converting the magnetic free energy stored in that structure into kinetic energy of eruption and acceleration of particles. So this is, uh, again, a slide we saw before, slightly updated to show even more detail on the formation of the magnetic flux rope due to shearing flows, for instance, seen on the left in frame B, followed by converging flows, followed by magnetic reconnection on a small scale, which builds up over time to create a largely twisted uh, flux rope in the corona. And then on the right is a, a more detailed MHD model of this process using an actual magnetogram as the boundary conditions um, to show that in, indeed twisted magnetic flux ropes form uh, in models as well as in theory. And then this is the observation showing that they form in reality as well as in models of theory. Um, again, on the left, it's an X-ray sigmoid taken by the Hinode X-ray telescope. And on the right is another model of flux rope injection model or nonlinear force-free field model uh, based on the actual magnetogram associated with that sigmoid. So 
So these things are real, they do exist, they're well modeled, and they've led to this sort of standard solar magnetic eruption model. Um, please don't call them flares, call them eruptions, because a flare is just part of this whole process, as we saw last week, and we'll review again. For many years, people just said flares were the causes of things like geomagnetic storms or solar energetic particle events. It's really not, it's the eruption itself that causes all of these things. And the flare is the photonic output. But anyway, to look at the standard model again in the event sequence, we've got a magnetic flux rope that we just saw formed over a polarity inversion line in, a, in an active region, or for instance, over a quiet sun filament channel. Um, energy builds up in that again due to continued shearing and twisting and or injection of additional flux um, into the system. Plasma instability, for instance, the torus kink instability triggers the eruption of the magnetic flux rope. Reconnection with overlying field allows the escape of the uh, structure to become what, what is known as an interplanetary CME. Sometimes this is called the breakout model because it has to break out of those overlying fields to get into the interplanetary space. And then reconnection below, uh, shown on the left by the big blue arrows going into the current sheet region, causes these jets both up upwards to help accelerate the plasma, uh, the, the flux rope, and downwards, colliding with the chromosphere um, structure below, and resulting immediately in hard X-ray and gyro synchrotron radiation that we'll see in a bit um, in another slide coming up. And finally, as that chromosphere heats up, it actually evaporates flux back into those loops that we saw, forming those very bright X-ray and EUV post-flare loop arcades. So this is a very commonly seen um, event sequence. Not all eruptions follow this exactly, but that's why it's called a standard model. It's pretty standard and you can always find exceptions, but um, in general, most flare, see, even I, even I still do it. Most eruptions still follow this uh, sequence. So this is another example of a large eruption back in 2006 and, uh, on the right, I show a nonlinear force free field extrapolation from the photospheric magnetogram. And this was the subject of a paper by Carl Schreiber in which they compared um, several different models of nonlinear force free fields on this one particular event, um, trying to get at which nonlinear force free field model did the, did the best in, in reproducing the flux, the, 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 the observed flaring and flux rope structure. And you can see. Uh, in this particular model, the red shading represents the electrical current flow, which is a characteristic of non-potential fields. Of course, you can't have currents flowing in potential fields, but here you have currents flowing along the axis of the twisted flux rope. And you can see as we play the movie in the next frame that the twisted flux rope exists between these two colliding sunspots. So these two sunspots have different polarities. Um, they've been brought into close contact and there's an obvious shearing flow below them and between them. And you see the flare going off there and then the flare ribbons separating um, away from the core of the twisted flux rope. So again, we'll see the uh, explosion here. This is taken in the calcium 2 H line. It's a visible line. So this is actually visible light. It's in the ultraviolet, but this is observable from the ground, although this is a space-based observation, which is why it's so high quality. But um, this points out that some flares are so powerful, they actually emit invisible light. And they're typically called white light flares in that case. Not all flares do this. Uh, this one was particularly large and the white light output was particularly bright. You can even see the post-flare loop arcades forming between the ribbons there as the flare uh, fades away. So again, a very clear illustration of the, you can see the shear flow along the umbra of the lower sunspot <clears throat> triggering or at least feeding into the, the energy storage of this eruption. So the standard model worked pretty well in that case. Uh, let's look a little bit more at the flare itself and what flares do. Um, this is uh, the time evolution of the electromagnetic radiation from a flare back in way back in 2001. So panel A on the top there shows a plot of the flare in several different uh, wavelengths. Um, 
In the black line, you see a radio wavelength, actually 6.6 .6 gigahertz. In the blue line, you see hard X-rays, as they're called, 100, about 100 kilo electron volt acceleration of, uh, of those particles producing X-rays when they collide with the chromosphere. Uh, the green is another hard X-ray wavelength. And then the red is the standard goes one to eight angstrom wavelength, the soft X-ray, as it's called. And you can see the profile is pretty different in all of these. Um, the 6.6 .6 gigahertz and the 100 keV hard X-rays follow each other pretty well. And either one of them is used to define what's called the impulsive phase of the flare. So a very fast, sharp peak, as we see here in both the blue, green, and black uh, curves, actually, um, followed typically by a gradual phase. Gradual, in this case, means it takes 20 to 30 minutes to peak, and then it takes an hour or more for that to decay. That's shown in the red with the soft x-rays. So I don't typically use these terms a lot. I mean, a solar flare is a very rapid, impulsive process. It's, it's not common to, to get into the weeds about what phase of the flare is going on when in space weather. When you talk about flare physics and particle acceleration from the current sheet, however, you, you do get into these kinds of fine details, both spatially and, and temporally. But from a space weather standpoint, we generally say it's just a flare. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really, we don't break it down into the phases. Um, on the bottom left, you see a couple of different overlays. The, the, the image itself is an extreme ultraviolet uh, wavelength image from the TRACE satellite at 171 angstroms. On the left is overlays of the hard X-ray contour showing that the hard X-rays occur in these kernels where we think, again, particles from the acceleration of the current sheet are bombarding the chromosphere and causing uh, this gyrosynchrotron radiation we see in radio, as well as this hard X-ray output uh, due to Bremsstrahlung uh, deceleration of the particles. And the bottom right shows the, the evolution over time of the flare ribbons. So, it's the, and those colors correspond to the colored bars you see up in the top plot um, over time. So the ribbons of the flare, as we saw in the movie, spread out over time as the field relaxes back to a more potential like uh, configuration. So again, sometimes you'll hear flares called hard and soft flares, depending on whether you're looking at hard x-rays or soft x-rays. This is more for the flare physicists. Um, it's not really a space weather distinction we often make, because it really doesn't matter in terms of effects of flares that we'll get into next week. Um, as, as we saw last time, flares are classified though by their X-ray irradiance, that soft X-ray irradiance. So here are plots from the GOES one to eight angstrom um, size instrument. And again, flares are classified by these letters, A, B, C, M, and X. <coughs> and you can see some examples here from that very active period back in 2003. And the new thing for this week is that space weather forecasting offices have their own scales for talking about flares. And the difference is they use R for the scale, uh, standing for radio blackout, due to historical association of solar flares with high frequency radio interference. That's basically how the field of solar physics really got its start is back in World War II, there was a lot of, um, I'm sorry, this, the, the field of space weather got its start. Back in World War II, um, there, they noticed that the transatlantic radio communications were um, affected by the sun. And they did a lot of investigation and found out it was finally due to, typically due to flares. Back then they were just observing in things like H alpha and visible light but they could correlate flares at least with radio blackouts. And so they called this scale the radio blackout scale. You can see it starts at M1. The association with the physical measure is over there in column four. Starts at M1 level. So they really don't pay, in, in space weather, we, we really don't pay attention to anything above about an M1 flare because it has no effect on anything. Even at the R1 level, the radio effects are pretty minimal. But as you go up, it's a logarithmic scale. So by the time you get to an R5, scale, you're talking about um, hemispherical blackout of high frequency radio. And we'll, again, we'll see examples of this when we look at planetary impacts next week. So another thing to be aware of is that um, it's not just x-rays that the flares put out or the UV, 
As mentioned, they, you, you can even get gamma rays on the high frequency side. You can go all the way out to radio waves in flares. And sometimes for reasons that aren't still quite understood, some flares can be very radio productive. And this is an example of one that took place in 2015. This was um, an event, uh, a relatively minor, minor, it was an M4 flare. So yeah, it's getting in, getting into the medium-sized flares that we'd like to pay attention to, but not that big a deal. Um, but it so happened that the it happened at sunset in Sweden, and the air traffic control radars at that time were pointed directly at the sun. And because of the radio output of this particular flare seen in the plot in the middle um, from the Sagamore Hill um, Air Force Solar Radio Telescope, because of the radio output of this flare directly into those ATC radar dishes, uh, they were completely noised out for at least an hour. And you can see the, the resulting news story there that was pretty surprising. They hadn't, we hadn't had anything like this happen in quite a while. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people started asking, well, how can a relatively minor flare do something like this? And it, again, it only really happened in Sweden, and it was only because their radars were pointed directly at the sun. At the time, the incoming planes were generally coming from the southwest direction for Sweden. So they really got uh, zapped by this particular radio flare. And again, you'll hear these things called radio bursts by the radio aficionados. They don't call them radio flares generally for some reason. This is another example of a solar radio burst and its effect on the GPS system. Um, this is a, a movie of GPS receivers all over the globe, part of the International GNSS Service Network. Um, and GPS op operates in a couple of bands, L1 and L2. The L1 band is at 1575 megahertz. And it so happened that the Owens Valley Solar Array uh, looks at the 1.6 gigahertz band. And this is a movie of that particular, this is again that 6 December 2006 event showing um, reception on these things going pretty well until the radio flare. <clears throat> And then you can see over a period of about half an hour, um, most of the North American GPS stations were inoperable. <clears throat> In other words, there was so much radio flux coming from the sun that the sunlit side of the earth was basically swamped in L1 noise and people could not get GPS lock um, for about a half an hour. And this is again, pretty rare, um, but it does happen. And it's something that is known and, and is we, we try to forecast it. Um, with variable success, as we'll see in lecture four of this particular series. This, <clears throat> excuse me, it's interesting to note this, but this same flare damaged the NOAA Solar X-ray Imager, which was a new X-ray telescope they just put out on, on, at the time in 2006, a new GOES satellite. And they were doing some really ill-timed testing of long exposures with the telescope um, and they got caught by this sunspot coming around the limb. So it wasn't, wasn't too outrageous that they were doing these tests then because they didn't know that there was a very large sunspot coming around the limb. Um, this very large sunspot caused a very large flare as seen here. And uh, you can see by that horizontal bright band going out on the CCD, that's essentially bleed along the column of that CCD pixel. And that thing never went away. In fact, they had several columns that were uh, destroyed by this flare. And that detector was never the same again. So that was a, a lesson learned. You should not do long exposure testing during solar maximum. Even if, even if you can't quite see the sunspot coming around the limb, it's probably too risky. All right, so moving on to coronal mass ejections, the other big element from solar magnetic eruptions. Not going to do too much here because we did a lot last week. So you guys know the characteristics of CMEs. You know how to compare them to what a solar wind stream does. Uh, we will just show examples though. This one is interesting because it's a CME that took place in 2012, seen there from the Lasco Sun Earth CM, um, coronagraph with a very nice flux rope going off at the end there. Um, and it turns out there was this was a far side eruption. So this eruption took place around the limb, the west limb of the sun. But it was noticeable right away because it was a very fast CME. The velocity estimated 
from the coronagraph imagery you see there was about 2,600 kilometers per second. So as you recall from last week, that's really cooking. The fastest ever measured is about 3,000. So this was one of the fastest CMEs ever seen. And people right away thought, okay, well, what, what's going on and where is this going? Well, where it happened to be going was directly towards a spacecraft in orbit around the sun at about the Earth's orbit called Stereo A. And Stereo A happened to be right in line with CME. And so as we saw last week, when you see a halo CME, that means the thing's coming right at you. And Stereo A was right in line with the CME, and as you can see, was swamped by a very energetic um, SCP event. It took 18 and a half hours about for the CME to get to Stereo A from, its, from the eruption time. And again, speaking to the, to the speed of this particular CME, that's comparable to the about 19 hour time that the famous 1859 Carrington event, which many people think was the largest space weather storm to occur on Earth, although we'll see next week uh, that it, it may have been equaled by some that we've seen since. We also saw in the previous plot on solar climate that in 1770, there was an event that was probably many, many times larger than the Carrington event. But in any case, the Carrington event is kind of the iconic space weather, big boogeyman storm we talk about from 1859, and it took 19 hours for that CME to hit the Earth. So this was called the Carrington event that we missed or the, the near miss Carrington event because it went off into interplanetary space, but we just happened to have a spacecraft sitting right there. And for those of you, I didn't talk too much last week about observations and observational systems. So for those of you who don't know what stereo is, um, it is a mission that NASA, NASA launched back in um, 2006. Didn't finish putting the caption on that one. Um, so the stereo mission launched in 2006 and um, it was two spacecraft that through an orbital maneuver with the moon got sent out in opposite directions, well, not opposite directions, following the earth, but one spacecraft, Stereo B, dropped behind the earth in its orbit sufficiently that it actually orbited the, the sun kind of in the opposite direction of the earth relative to the earth, while Stereo A got kicked ahead and Stereo A, uh, as its name implies, orbited ahead of the earth. And you can see there, over time, they marched out across the 1AU circle, basically. And um, from about the period of 2010 to 2015, when they kind of both went behind the sun, there was five years there where every CME that came off the sun, we saw it with three different spacecraft, two stereos and one uh, LASCO, which we've been looking at, the Sun-Earth line coronagraph on, at the L1 point on the SOHO uh, spacecraft. So for a time there, we had this, this golden age of CME observations where we could see everything that came off the sun from three different directions triangulated very well. And the forecasted arrival times of the CMEs at Earth got much better than they are now. They improved by about a factor of two, as we'll see uh, in lecture four of the, of the space weather series here. So that's the stereo mission. And in 2012, you can see there that the stereo mission was kind of right around the limb of the sun uh, where that big, very fast CME went. And um, that's why it got, a, it, got hit, it got a direct hit. And it carries, luckily, it carries a lot of great instrumentation for space weather diagnostics, like a coronagraph, like solar wind particle measurement uh, uh, instrumentation, like magnetic field instrumentation. So we have lots of data on this particular event from the Stereo A spacecraft. Um, on the right, I'm showing a, a current plot of where the spacecraft are. You can see they've rotated all the way around and past the Earth. And so Stereo A is now um, behind us. And Stereo B, unfortunately, was lost in 2016. Uh, there was an operator error. So that satellite's no longer in the constellation. But Stereo A is still out there uh, marching around, along in its orbit. And you can go to this website noted there and find out exactly where not only stereo A are, but you can see Parker Solar Probe, for instance. This is a plot for today. I just added it to the slide today. And you can see lots of different spacecraft on these plots. It's a, it's a very nice tool from the stereo mission. So a little bit more about this event. Um, on the left, you can see a, a model of the event. This is the WSA Enlil 
um, CME model that we'll talk about it you know, a little bit more and much more in, in future lectures. And you can see plasma density on the far left and plasma radial velocity on the, the plot on the right there. Uh, this is looking down on the equatorial plane. The sun is the yellow dot in the middle. The earth is the green dot. And stereo A is that little red square. And you can see it caught the CME directly head on. So again, the transit time all the way out to uh, stereo A over 18.6 hours means it was about 2,150 kilometers per second, one of the fastest ever measured again or, or observed. And you can see that one of the things that made this particular event very strong in terms of its radiation uh, storm magnitude was that the middle plot here shows the days before the eruption on the 23rd. And you can see there was a CME, which they call in this paper, uh, by Baker at all. Actually, this is from a different paper. Uh, I'll get the reference on there. But this paper shows that there was what they call ICME zero. Uh, I'm not sure why the shading is where it is. I think they, they really go for the radial field and the tangential field changes to define the CME. But you can see the shock is that dotted line there. Uh, so the shock and the density and the velocity are very obvious. There was a CME that pre preceded the, the, the bigger CME on the 24th by about three days. And as Steve mentioned in the last lecture, these kind of one-two punch CMEs are believed to be um, some of the most powerful CMEs because that first CME sort of clears out the interstellar sp interplanetary space and allows the second CME to, be, uh, to go A, very fast, and therefore B, accelerate particles to very high energies. And on the far right, you can see the, the solar wind um, properties measured at stereo A from that eruption which the eruption took place on the 23rd, but it arrived at the spacecraft on the 24th. And again, these authors, for some reason, consider this two different CMEs. I'm not sure exactly why. It looks like one to me. There's a big shock. There's uh, sort of what you would expect in terms of magnetic field variation. There's some, there's some you know, rotation and variation within the magnetic field, but I'm not sure I would necessarily qualify this as two different eruptions, but they do anyway. And on the very bottom, what they're showing is a simulation of what would happen to the Earth's magnetic field um, from this CME. And we'll talk about this more next week. This is a measure of the magnetic field disturbance at the Earth. And the magnitude cited there of minus 598 nanotesla and minus 1150 nanotesla, two different estimates of what this CME would have done, put this geomagnetic storm, this is basically a measure of a geomagnetic storm, it puts this geomagnetic storm in the class of the most powerful storms ever experienced on Earth. So this would have been a Carrington event at Earth, we think, um, had it actually gone in the direction of Earth. But as you can see from the plots on the right, uh, we missed it entirely. OK, so that's sort of an overview of CME effects on interplanetary space. One thing we didn't talk about um, as a signature of CMEs last week is their radio emission. So just like um, flare radio emission due to accelerated particles crashing into the chromosphere, CMEs themselves um, have uh, effects on particles as they, as they move out into space. And the gyrosynchrotron radiation from these accelerations can cause what we call type 2 radio bursts. So on the the two panels A and B there show that before and during images from a coronagraph back in 2011. And on the right, you see, again, a Sagamore Hill uh, radio plot. This is basically a, a wavelet diagram of frequency versus time. And you can see these, this very sh uh, sharp drop in frequency, this kind of uh, L-shaped um, drop. And then you see also a, a, a line of type 2 emission coming off of what they think is the shock front of the CME. And the slope of that line has been shown to correlate to speed. Now, you have to be very careful, though. Some people will measure these things because it's one of the first indications we can get of the speed of the CME before it's hit Earth or anything. And they'll look at that, and they'll say, oh my god, it's 3,000 kilometers a second, and they'll predict the Carrington event. And then what, what happens is CMEs inevitably decelerate uh, as they move out into interplanetary space particularly if, they, if they're hitting ambient slow solar wind and it hasn't been cleared out by a previous CME like we saw, and it'll slow down drastically. And so the CME speed from type two radio emission is often way off, just to 
keep that in mind when you see those estimates. But it does have that radio signature. And as we mentioned last week, solar energetic particles, both impulsive from the eruption site and uh, gradual from the CME shock exist. Um, I'll just point out again that for the same acceleration um, energy, you get much more speed out of an electron. If you put two MeV into an electron, you can accelerate that to 0.97 C. Uh, the same thing, uh, 100 MeV proton only gets up to about 0.4 C. So. Keep that in mind as we talk about interplanetary signatures uh, a little bit more here. I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time. It's the same one we showed last time, just contrasting CME versus CIR um, uh, signatures in the solar wind. But I will show you this one, which we didn't show last time, which is a more detailed picture of a, uh, a CIR in space. So as opposed to the very sharp shocks you see from CMEs, here you see the magnetic field does increase kind of abruptly. It has a sudden rotation of the field followed by kind of an abrupt increase in the magnitude up at the top there as you go from slow solar wind speed in the bottom frame up to fast speed or fast stream on the, on, on the right. And then the density and temperature, you do see that forward weak shock and the reverse weak shock as the CIR rotates past the Earth. And the bottom frame just shows that there were no big flares or anything going on in the last 48 hours. That, that bump there is a B flare. The scale is just um, is, is way down because the sun was actually very quiet at this time. So that's a very typical signature of a CIR, this forward shock, reverse shock, um, and fairly weak rotation of the magnetic field. However, this did cause a medium scale geomagnetic storm at the Earth because the uh, the magnetic field configuration was ideal for reconnecting with our magnetosphere. And we'll talk about that again more next week. This is again the same one I showed last week with this very clear CME signature of shock sheath rotation, velocity shock, density shock within the sheath. So again, just a reminder that it's, it's a very clear signature when you have a CME versus a CIR. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show this one. That was just showing how big the CMEs are compared to the Earth. This is new though, this is the WSA Enlil magnetohydrodynamic program I talked about earlier, showing a movie now of two CMEs being propagated out into the earth. And this is what the forecasters used to try and predict when these things are gonna hit the earth. So again, the earth is the yellow, uh, the sun is the yellow dot, the earth is a green dot. And um, if I play that again, you could see these pulses going out and they try to see when those pulses are gonna hit earth uh, and therefore time the arrival uh, for forecasting geomagnetic storms. It's important to point out that this model, while the magnetic field is included in the solar wind, uh, because it's based on the photospheric magnetic field, the CMEs are put in as hydrodynamic um, pulses. So there's no magnetic field in the CME simulation other than what it sweeps up in the solar wind. So it's not a good, you can't use this to predict the directionality of the magnetic field uh, from a CME. And again, I'm gonna skip this one in the interest of time. We showed it last week. It's really just, again, emphasizing that CMEs are not as modeled in the previous model, for instance, nice smooth structures created by hydro, <laughs> hydrodynamic pistons that they put in at the, at, the, at the boundary conditions. They're very complex, turbulent um, clouds of material coming out. And this is showing from the stereo uh, heliospheric imager instrument how complex those clouds are as they approach Earth. Also points out how difficult it is to forecast the arrival time and also the, the magnetic field direction. So this is the SCP um, effects in deep space, interplanetary space. And we showed this one last time again, but it's always good to show to emphasize the amount of energetic particles that can be launched by a solar magnetic eruption and, and a CME shockwave plowing through interplanetary space. And I point out that this is this is just a visible light camera. So this will happen to any camera in space. It also happens to the human eye. Um, astronauts in space, particularly in the space station, talk about seeing fireflies. Um, typically that's from galactic cosmic rays, but if there were ever a large SEP event that penetrated down to the International Space Station um, altitude, it's pretty protected by the magnetosphere and the atmosphere, uh, the, the, the residual atmosphere up there. But if it ever did penetrate that, that far down, they would be seeing basically what you're seeing now um, in their eyes. So 
that's a, a, a very well-known space weather biological effect. Okay, so um, let's look at partic in a particular at a particular SCP event. This was a very large eruption in 2005, and this is just a timing diagram showing that the X-ray magnitude on the top frame peaks at about 7 UT. It starts at about 6:35, and the SCPs detected at L1 by the A spacecraft. Um, begin to rise about 16 minutes after the eruption. So this is uh, these ions, which are going up to about two me, you know, five MeV ions, got up to about half the speed of light uh, from that eruption. So that's typically what you see, a flare start, and about 15 to 30 minutes later, uh, the, the energetic particles, if there are going to be energetic particles, uh, do, do begin to pick up. You, you have to be magnetically connected again. This diagram we showed last time, this shows this was again an S3 event back in 2005. And this event is also talked about um, in a descriptive scale by NOAA. So they talk about some of the biological satellite operations and other system effects on this scale. So S3 is about you know, medium scale. However, this one did create a very large ground level event. In other words, there were enough high energy protons getting up to about one GeV that impacted the top of the atmosphere, that it ended up creating a neutron shower, particularly at the South Pole, which saw a 5,000% increase in neutrons at this particular time. So that was a very large GLE, one of the largest in the last uh, 50 years. And this points out that you have to be magnetically connected by the Parker spiral field to the site of the eruption in general to get uh, solar energetic particle events. What's shown on the left there is, is uh, locations of all the SCP events uh, from solar cycle 24 up to about 2014 from M5 plus flares. So you can see most of them are clustered near the limb because the solar magnetic field lines are curving away and back towards us. And then the, on the upper right, we show an event that was actually behind the limb, much like the July event we talked about earlier, but this one created a, a significant uh, ground level event even at Earth because we were magnetically connected to that active region behind the limb. So this is what it looks like. This is, oh, this is actually the 10th September, the very large eruption I showed at the beginning um, when it was rotated up to the north, the very large eruption from 10 September to 17. And it's, it emphasizes the fact that again, those relativist, relativistic electrons uh, travel much faster than the protons. And in this case, uh, they arrived about 47 minutes earlier than the protons. So the flare was going off, um, you know, very close to the, the, the electron arrival time. And the relativistic ions and protons um, take about 47 minutes, in this case, to get out to the uh, detector, detection at uh, L1 by the ACE satellite. So some people have talked about using relativistic electrons is kind of a warning for incoming SEPs. And it's been, it's been successful in some cases like this, but it's not uh, reliable enough to turn into a, to a hard product that forecasters can use. It's, it's kind of, I, I guess you would say it's still in the research phases right now. So that is it. Um, next week, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll go on to talk about what happens when this kind of stuff that we've seen in interplanetary space actually hits the earth. And this paper by Dolores Knipp discusses a, a very famous event in 1967, which included a radio flare and a very strong CME, which had some very unexpected effects in addition to just creating a nice aurora. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, any questions on any of this? Another another whirlwind tour, I realize. 